Open up Colorado. It's 420. Time to grind and burn. This is not your son, Stoner Show. Welcome to the Cannabis Community Project. This is Brainstorm. Once again, bring you your weekly broadcast podcast from the CCP studios high up in Denver, Colorado. Here exploring the business side of this newly emerging economy, focusing on the business, the patient, the retailer, to the geek in the garage, creating that next innovation in cannabis. This is the first media platform to help fellow cannapreneurs just like you. While living the lifestyle. You deserve more. Herbox is here to give you more. Fortunately, the cannabis laws and stereotypes are slowly being changed. Herbox is a medical and recreational cannabis container that brings style and fashionable credibility to the cannabis community and movement. Check out our website at herbbox.com, which is H-E-R-B-B-O-X-X.com. Accessories say a lot about a person, and Herbbox says that you are exquisite and superior. Cheers. Hey, Cannapreneurs, welcome to another beautiful Saturday afternoon. It's 420 where I am. What time is it where you are? This is another episode of the Cannabis Community Project, show number 78. As always, thank you very much for joining us, and thank you to patronizing our sponsors, as well as the guests that we have on the show. This week's show, we have Weed Wipes. Jim Barry is going to talk to us about his company of cleaning resin, cleaning pipe. He's here locally in the Colorado area. I use the product about every two weeks when I clean my pipe. And he was gracious enough to invite us up to his location to sit us down for the afternoon, spend some time with us, take us through the ins and outs of his business. And we did have some fun time. I think there is even a couple shots of some very expensive whiskey involved. So we'll have that coming up in the main interview in just a few minutes. I also want to thank everybody just one last time as we do a final wrap up on our crowdfunding campaign, Indiegogo. For those of you who did contribute and donate, you can expect your gifts to be coming through the mail in the next week or two. I'm going to be sending those out. Most of you chose the package where your gift is the Cushley products. So thank you very much to both Cushley for being a sponsor and providing those products and thank you to you for donating enough money that requires me to sound out a gift although all dollars are appreciated and uh, you know who you are so thank you very much speaking of podcast did you see the uh, note last week I'm working on a second podcast finally as we close in two years of the CCP radio show we finally come to a point where we think we're ready to start a second podcast this one's going to be a little bit different the deity dozen <laughs> this one you're just going to have to wait and see what it's all about i officially joined the first church of cannabis out of indianapolis last week maybe the week before i did my donation i became a member i'm going to get my card in the mail the first church of cannabis is actually a church that received tax exempt status and they got a message that they're bringing out to the world and their message is wrapped up in 12 guidelines guiding principles commandments if you will and when i took one look at them i said this would make a great podcast because these 10 commandments or guiding principles is a way to look at life a way to look at religion but yet a way to still keep it under the cannabis umbrella so my second podcast is going to be called the deity dozen i'm putting it together now it'll be a few weeks before i finally get around to that first episode being rolled out as i'm still working out the format and what exactly it is the show will be based on but more or less we're going to explore this idea of being a canitarian which is what you're called if you're a member of the first church of cannabis and a canitarian is more than just simply a 
name or a title. It's a way of life like any other religion one follows. So I'm going to use myself as the experiment. I'm going to be the focus of my own path. And I'm going to have conversations with people about these 12 guiding principles of being a Canitarian, the validity of the application of these principles in one's life. And the conversation will probably get deep, sometimes serious. And like always, I'll try to make it as fun as possible so we can actually learn something that gives us just a little bit more than what other people are doing out there on the market right now. I've seen a lot of podcasts. I've heard a lot of podcasts. I get a sense of where people are going with podcasts, especially in the cannabis industry. And I think this might be a unique show because it's not about spirituality. It's not about, you know, doing cannabis yoga. It's not about the nutritional side of holistic healing. It's actually going to be talking about a religion, a specific religion, a canitarian. And it's about a journey of what it takes to become a canitarian following these 12 principles. And the conversations I have with people are going to be real. They're going to be deep, but they're going to be relevant to cannabis and life. So CCP radio show focuses on the business side. The Deity Dozen is going to focus on the life side. I'll have that for you in a few weeks, but I I hope you all check it out because I love podcasting. And if these work out, I'm going to bring a third one to you, then a fourth one. And before you know it, we're going to have a whole network, otherwise known as a radio station. That's right. We're working up to a radio station. We're not working backwards. And I say that because as I'm talking about these podcasts, about me adding more, and I'm talking about other people in podcasting. And I had a conversation just last week with a business owner from a dispensary who said he was hit up by a number of other cannabis radio stations, blah, blah, blah. And we actually got into a pretty good topic that I think relates to all shows I do here on the CCP radio show. But in general, if you're starting a business, something to think about. The age old adage of putting the cart before the horse. So I have approaching two years of doing my show now. And I do a show. Notice I don't say it's a radio station. I do a show. And I guess technically it is a podcast, but I call it a radio show because I think of the format and how it's presented and what I'm doing and just for clarity, a radio show. But I'm doing a show. I'm not trying to do a whole station or a network. I'm doing a show. This is my product. When this product reaches a point of success where a critical mass is supporting it to the point where we can expand our product, we will create a second show. We will work our way up to multiple products, creating a company. And then out of that will come a brand that we will be known for based on our product. Sometimes I speak to people and I speak to a lot of people about business. You know, I'm not just doing a podcast. I'm actually involved in the business world. I'm involved in my own businesses and I'm involved in other people's businesses. And I get the chance as a nature of the podcast to just speak to a lot of first timers and entrepreneurs and up and comers. And I hear all too often the car going before the horse. People speaking to me about wanting to build brands and then figure out what their product is. Hmm. Interesting. People talking to me about wanting to build a radio station about cannabis, but yet they don't have a single show that they do, that they produce, or that they're even associated with at this point. And if you put all those things in perspective, it's the same idea. You start with a product and you build a company, then you build a brand. You don't build a brand and then expect a company to be formed because your brand allows you to then develop product. It doesn't even make sense. It's jargon people throw around because they hear it being talked about out in the back. Understand the fundamentals of what you're building. Start with a product. And I say this because I'm like a lot of people. I have a billion and a half ideas and I want to take action on three-fourths of those. I want to have 22 companies starting up today and 22 more tomorrow. Yeah, I know. We all get like that. But at the end of the day, I have to stop. And I have to say, (laughs) maybe one day. But right now, I need to focus on the single product I do have. Turn that product into a company. And then work on turning that company into a brand. And then if I am successful at those stages, maybe I'll be afforded the opportunity to explore another one of my ideas. And that's really what I hope most people take away from these interviews with entrepreneurs. Notice we don't go to big companies. We don't speak to huge CEOs, people who have organizations under them of hundreds of people or more. We're talking about mom pop shops, people who are wanting to start businesses, literally them and their spouse or them and their friend, them by 
by themselves. They're trying to work through the fundamentals of business, basics of marketing, and they're trying to basically just forge out a life for themselves. Well, here's how you do it. Focus on your product and don't think about anything else, even beyond that product. Don't think about where your company is going to expand, how you're going to franchise off. Don't think about anything, a second product, until you finished working on your first product. That is a recap of what I hear other successful people talk about. And that's a recap of what I've noticed in my own experiences to help people move forward in a more efficient way. So listen to Jim Barry in his interview. He has a product and we talk about the growth of that product into the business and into the brand. And think about that for your own. When you wake up every day, what are you thinking about and doing most of the time? Are you focusing on your product or are you thinking about what you're going to do next? Well, while we all contemplate on that, let's make sure we don't forget what we learned last week. With last week's short-term memory flashback relapse, let me give you just a couple minutes. A Brittany Roar, do you remember her? I'm another entrepreneur, a young woman in Las Vegas who's really putting her heart and soul into a company, doing some great innovation with online security, doing something that most of us wish we could be doing. So let's make sure we learn what she taught us last week, and then we'll move into this week's show. Here we go. Grinding Bird. My name is Brittany Rohr. I work for CannabisCheckout.com, and our tagline is the only secure cannabis network. So Where are you based out of? I'm based out of Las Vegas. Excellent. You're, you're working from Las Vegas, and are you launching this with a, a national market in mind? Yeah, nationally. So what is the specific demographic of who you're going after here? Well, our goal is to actually not just focus on dispensaries and users as our competition. What we're trying to do is we're trying to let everybody use the community space to network, but this Obviously, everything happens for a reason, so I feel like I moved here to Vegas to be able to meet the right people and be able to try the new things, and now I have a whole new company. How are you going about the startup of this from a financial aspect? Are you self-funding through credit cards and savings? Are you working with investors? Uh, Self-started, self-funded savings. Lots and (laughs) lots and lots of savings. (laughs) So you have everything on the line. This is it for you. Yes. This is, this is my life. This is my, my all. What's the big goal for this year, the big leap you're trying to make to, to launch this company successfully? I would say getting all of the different businesses that can advertise to know that they have the ability to. The really cool thing that makes us different than all the other sites out there is that we allow other kind of businesses to advertise to their target clients. And we make the site amazing and completely new age for this, for this community. Are you doing this while trying to work another job at the same time or is this your main gig that you're doing right now? This is my main job. I do a couple other little things like consulting and uh, I teach uh, Ariel as well. But yeah, this is my main thing. How many hours a week would you say you're putting into this uh, business? Uh, That's a good question. On most weeks, I put in probably about 60 hours not including my other jobs, but then I have a couple weeks where I'll have bad migraines, so here and there I can't control that, so that's why I work really hard on the weeks that I can, and then on the weeks that I really have migraine issues, then I have to take a step back and let it go. Your idea has to be sound. You have to be answering a problem in the market. That was what took me into the next level, I would believe. Also, you have to make sure that you have enough funding in order to complete that project, because I think a lot of entrepreneurs go into something thinking, oh, I'll just get it up and going, and then I I'm okay, and I don't have any plans on if I need the extra money that I can get it. I think with my situation, I have already lined up investors in case I need them, um, which is extremely important in this industry, especially. Again, answering a problem in the market. All right. Well, th- this has been very interesting, a very informative conversation and something that I think uh, other people are going to be quite as intrigued about. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sounds good. And, um, Thank you very much for your time as well and, and your your exposure. I really do appreciate that. And then let's stay in touch so we can keep doing uh, future type follow-ups and stuff. Have you part of Sounds- the community. Sounds great, and, and I'll save your number on my phone, too. <laughs> ah, I'm in the phone book now. All right. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. 
that you like the businesses you hear. Maybe you're a business just like that. Maybe you have a thought or an idea that would be perfect for this community. Contact me. I'll get you on the air. I want to discuss these issues. Everything in the news, from health, legal, food, music, growing technology, business. We talk about it all here. Cannabis Community Project. The six degrees of Cushley. Yeah, it's amazing. I'm excited to announce we have a new sponsor. Please welcome Cushley Odor Eliminator. You heard them on the show. Now they've come on board officially as sponsors of the Cannabis Community Project. Give them a welcome. Reach out and say hi. Cushley. Cushley. Here, it looks pretty cool. I think it's actually a better the odor elimination rather than the perfume or the cover up. I mean, there's nothing more humorous than walking into a room with a heavy smell of incense. It almost gives away what you're doing. It pretty much tells you what you're doing. Some people who, you know, take a moment and actually write in and say, you know, thank you. And we really appreciate this product really making a difference for someone. You can find us very easily. Info, I-N-F-O, at Cushley.com. I don't pull my string. Don't don't you even start high. Yes, <laughs> snatch that son of a bitch and get her going, boy. Um, my name is Rodney. I am with the Critical Issue and Awareness Opportunity Group. What we have done is work to highlight the abilities of mechanically assisted and physically encumbered people through doing the things that can be done. We work with infrastructure projects such as making sure that water grates are changed and ramps are put in and bathrooms are done for wheelchairs and we really care about access and mobility because we think that people should have the ability to get out of the situations that they get themselves into. That is a charity that was started at the Metropolitan State University of Denver. We have a lot of good participation with Auraria Campus on getting some things done. However, it is a charity. Needless to say that charities need to be funded and so what we have decided to do was to develop an outreach program called iJAM Media Services I-J-Y-A-M Media Services and basically what iJAM Media Services is about is the ubiquitous use of marijuana and hemp for the betterment of community environment and liberty. It is entirely about being able to reach around the world and bring people to this beautiful place that we call home, showing what they have and then sending them back with the opportunity for more access and mobility in those areas following the marijuana industry. It works for everyone, not just someone in a wheelchair. It works for people that don't want to go up the stairs because their knees hurt, and that would be a better thing for access and mobility for mechanically assisted people, physically encumbered people. What we have decided to do is develop content, and the way that we're developing content is by using assisted living facilities to hold events. And that way we can maintain a sense of access and mobility, learning and understanding what those issues are while entertaining the community. We think that all of these things going together also coincides with a lot of technological advancement that we have going on. And so we are definitely looking into becoming part of the crypto revolution. We are definitely looking into becoming one of the preferred and I guess you would put us right at the finger tip of creation when it comes to charitable organizations on the internet and you know we are planning some pretty exciting events and as soon as i come up with a name for my international global dominating event company that i'm going to install which is going to be with iGEM media services i will let you guys know but thank you for this opportunity to be on your show <laughs> smells so green and now me too Boing, 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 boing.
Smells so green. Now, how about you? <laughs> it goes back to, uh, I think, uh, the youth of a lot of people in my generation when marijuana was akin to stuffing straw in your mouth and setting it on fire. It was pretty harsh, nasty stuff in those days, not like the, uh, the sweet buds we all uh, seem to see around town now. Got just the thing to make you smile. Mighty wonder. Mm, I'll turn that frown upside down and make you happy. Take my hand now, I'll take you somewhere and play, baby. Mighty wonder. Go kick off your shoes, let's go dancing in the rain. Mm. This is fairly new equipment, and uh, I guess this is the state. State of the art of, of broadcasting nowadays. Podcast right here in a handheld device. Really? This is all it takes to have your own media channel nowadays. Wow, that's impressive. That is as small as a f- cell phone I've owned. Yes. Yes. And, uh, you know, you get yourself a decent microphone and a couple headphones and a, a good internet connection, and now you have a media channel. I, Just it, like that. Yeah, and it's amazing. I mean, there's this, it, it, that's a broadcast ma- mic on top, and then you've got an octopus coming out to all these different uh, yeah. uh, pieces here. Right. It's, that, it's quite a piece All of packed up in a suitcase. How fast do we go from inside to outside? That, that's where technology is nowadays. That's impressive. Well, I mean, you are in the technology game, right? Well, do you consider Weed Wipes technology? It's chemistry, chemistry on a certain level, but technology, yeah. it's, just, it's the logical next step. In a lot of ways, it's almost uh, uh, going backwards because it's natural and organic rather than something that's a new chemical put out by Monsanto or something like that. Well, let's talk about it. Let's record it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, but we're not hippies, though. We're like tech hippies. Hi, I'm Jim Berry with Weed Wipes. Weed Wipes, the all-natural resin remover. Taste your weed, not the resin. Not isopropyl alcohol. Not chemicals made by Monsanto. It's all natural, edible. Weedwipes.com. Have you ever thought about doing voiceover work? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go, yeah. I've been told that a couple of times, actually. Yeah, yeah. you could do movies, TV commercials, and yeah, so forth. I've, I've, and I've definitely got a face made for radio. So. <laughs> You have a beautiful backyard where we took the studio to you on this fine Saturday afternoon. It's uh, almost out of a a novel, rain coming down, trees green, microphones set up, sharing some finely grown flower and and concentrates and learning all about you. Well, thanks. Uh, Yeah, actually, it's a a very nice backyard and and, uh, and we did share some pretty good stuff. So if I drift off a little bit, just slap me back in line. (laughs) By the time people hear this interview, they'll have already heard at least two clips of your introduction. One, when I have a segment on my show from Monday night with All Time High, Mm -hmm. Ari Love, the the networking event, and also the clip from Wednesday, Weed Wipe Wednesday, a segment when we were here the other night, we wrote a blog about it. Perfect. So by the time this full interview comes out, you'll have been mentioned a couple times, so hopefully people will have heard of you, and a good time to actually sit down and and learn more in depth, rather than just the tagline, right? (laughs) Perfect. Well, thanks. The woes and the pains of being an entrepreneur, a canopreneur. Um, where are you at in this business development? Are you a startup? Are you in in the stages of growing? Where, where do you consider yourself? Well, considering we just started January 1st of this year, that's, what, eight months ago. Yeah. We are still in the growing stage. Actually, we recently changed our product slightly due to customer input. We went from a cup paste product to an all-liquid two-ounce bottle, so doubling the amount of cleaner in every uh, sale. Listening to your customer could be the beginning or end of a company, and in this case, it sounds like you heard them and you changed. Honestly, the first sample I got, a paste sample, I went home and tried to figure out how to use it. I was you know, poking it in my pipe with Q-tips. And I personally did not have a top user-friendly review to necessarily give at the time. Mm -hmm. But then I used the liquid product and cleaned two of my pipes in in the equivalent of maybe, you know, 15 minutes or so. And uh, understood, oh, okay, finally, you know, the product you adapted so it could be user-friendly in a way that that lets the product survive. So uh, uh, good listening skills. (laughs) Two thumbs up. Well, and (laughs) and it turns 
turns out that, that we actually have an application for the paste version in the fact that it works on grow scissors as well as concentrates and uh, extractors and things like that. So it is an option either way. Mm-hmm. We recently did a rebranding to sell into the areas that are not weed friendly, just states that aren't quite up to the pot level yet. We have branded a mile high cleaner. In what category do you place yourself? A house cleaning products? Are you in uh, exclusively growing type products? We're, 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 do you register with the state and have to give like a category number or they give you one or something? Do they place you in a certain category? It, it, the category is cleaner. Okay. Uh, but it's natural cleaner. So it's something that is not as regulated considering all the ingredients that are in it are natural. Right. That makes it a little bit easier. And I categorize myself in basically the, the cleaning industry because we clean up any weed-based mess. Right. It was specifically designed only for marijuana. However, it did bleed over into any agricultural endeavor that gets sap on it. Uh, one of my employees' wives is a horticulturist, and she uses it on her scissors to trim her flowers. Do you think you'll have to rebrand or, or create a secondary-type company to pursue that market outside of cannabis just because of the name itself, Weed Wipe? might limit your potential overall market uh, maybe conjuring up uh, old ladies freaking out uh, in, in grocery stores well i i understand that and yes there is a little bit of stigma around the the uh, marijuana industry and that is the uh mile high cleaner is the rebranding for states that don't quite accept it mm-hmm. as readily as everyone else Right. Do you come from a cleaning background? Is this, you worked your way up the cleaning ladder or how how does one become the uh, proprietor of a cleaning product? Well, I actually had a kind of a strange background. For the last 32 years, I've been the vice president of a small company that specialized in selling furniture to the government. And then on January 1st, it started Weed Wipes because I had figured out a formula for cleaning the resin. The reason I did it is because, well, uh, A number of years ago, I had several accidents. I had about 15 broken bones, went into medical marijuana, got my red card to smoke. And when I did, I realized after 25 years, nothing had changed in the cleaning industry. (laughs) I was a little disappointed in that. I took it upon myself to actually do something about it. And in doing so, researched a little bit. I've got to say, I do not have much of a background in this. I'm actually a ninth grade dropout without even a GED, but I do possess about a 151 IQ. And upon doing enough research, I figured out the correct formula of all natural, edible, inert oils that were odorless and tasteless that worked on all five kinds of resin. Everything from the oily stuff that comes out of the back of the joint all the way up to the burnt-on stuff that comes around the, the edge of the bowl. I did this so that it would be a natural cleaner. And when I say it's edible, yeah, there's there's a few videos out right. there of me doing that. <laughs> I, I think it really uh, takes a fine line to balance that world of coming from something that you're just passionate about because since you were nine years old, your father did it and his grandfather did it. And now you're carrying on the traditional cleaners versus somebody who comes across just a good idea and a good product. And it sounds like you're, you're kind of an inventor type, right? Maybe a, a little bit more on the product development and constantly thinking about design ideas and what's next in the market, uh, correct? Oh, very much so. Right. I'm, I'm kind of the guy that fills in all the gaps. <laughs> uh, if there's a new valve system that needs, needs to be created for the delivery system to fill the bottles, I'm the guy that gets it done and gets it done quick. Right. Well, I got that sense as when I, when I showed up today, I had my little piece, uh, my little stomper or snuffer topper type piece. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I could see how you immediately went to go to work on redesigning it. And <laughs> uh, sorry about that. It's a great design already. I just always look at things and, no, no, and no, figure no, no. out the next level. I, I love the idea of redesigning it. And I, I, uh, I'm i saying I appreciate that quality that you're a person who's looking to like, oh, you know, oh, great. I see the concept. Now, you know, what's the best concept of product that can be produced from this? So, you know, what's the best product that can be manifested from this concept? So exactly. that I totally agree with. And I, th- I actually think we came up with a great design. <laughs> right. Between the three of us here, we kind of hash that out pretty well. Look for it soon on the CCP store. (laughs) Indeed. You'll love it. Well, that's what I'm saying. Uh, You know, if it can be pumped out at 
50, 75 cents a piece. Oh, yeah. They're almost giveaway items. And, but and tchotchkes are bought in the millions. And even though you're only getting a penny or two every time, that's millions of pennies, and that builds right? up fast. Is your business model one of ownership that says you're going to build like a direct sales where you're going to individually just sell a lot of product? Or are you looking to take more of a uh, corporate standpoint where maybe you retail out, franchise out, or have different layers throughout? Out the country kind of developing. What What is your overall model that you're foreseeing weed wipes taking? Well, as a matter of fact, we've got several avenues, but I actually prefer to build the economy. So we have retailers uh, that are dispensaries as well as smoke shops, but we also have distributors. We work through the distributors so that people in your area can actually have it. The big thing is I know that getting my product out there is going to actually save people. Mm. I, I don't know if you realize how bad isopropyl alcohol alcohol, the standard cleaner for resin is. But what we looked for is getting it as broad as we can. The only place we actually sell retail is on weedwipes.com for us. Everything else is sold through a distributor or a, a retailer. Now, is this a proprietary uh, design or product to you, the, something you own in a patent form or, or some type of uh, protected document? Yes, indeed. The documents that come out from the government are varied and many and very boring, but we actually do have a in process for a patent. A patent? Yes. Based, what type of patent? Like a based on like the application of cleaning with this type of product or is the product itself a patent that you're going for well it because it is a whole new way of cleaning it's it's the way of doing it okay as well as so you're selling a methodology indeed because right now with people they're using solvents like like I say, isopropyl alcohol or Formula 420, Formula 710. And any solvent does one thing. It breaks down chains. And people are protein chains. That's the biggest problem. So instead of using a solvent, what I've done is use the correct oils that are utilize polar attraction and encapsulation. Is this something that you individually own or, or do you own it with a group of people or a corporation? No, it's just me. Okay. I, uh, I did actually recently sell off a small, small percentage of the company to, to raise funds to uh, uh, do more, in- more inventory. But I think you're doing it the right way. You see, you, you become indispensable and then people will come to you and then you can command your own salary. Well, this is why I figured uh, I was list when I was about a year and a half ago, almost two years, when I was looking around at all the other shows, I kind of saw what they were doing and I was like, eh, you know, they're not really hitting on anything I'm interested in and they're not really talking in anything that's really informative or even entertaining at that point. Right. So I figured, well, what if it were a show that were just kind of thought about in a different way? What if it were a show about business and it mm-hmm. just happened to focus on cannabis, but just as if it were a, a show about Billy Mays, the greatest uh, pitch man ever, <laughs> you know, who, who had a reality TV show, right? Sure. You know, it's like anything else, anything else that's that's in media. And that's how I went about it. So I look at it as if people are interested in being involved in the industry and I go out and meet with a bunch of businesses, then I get to create contacts with industry insiders mm-hmm. and create contacts with a community of people wanting to be in that industry and kind of be in the middle of that. I don't I don't know if it, it, will, if it will pay off in anything beyond just self-sufficient. Like, I don't know if it'll blow up to be like some huge multi-million dollar venture, but it could definitely lead to something else that could be a multi-million dollar venture. And that's how I look at it. I don't know. I think it could go both those ways, actually, because it, this is such a fledgling industry. Let's think about how people are out there and they're trying to figure out what's the best way to go. How do I do this? Where can I get this? There's a lot of different questions out there, and very few of them are being answered by an authoritative source, and very few of them are being even looked at on Ooh, certain levels. Write so, that down, authoritative source. I want to use that phrase. And uh, <laughs> You do realize this is... <laughs> recording he doesn't need to write it down <laughs> as an authoritative force i need to tell him write it down <laughs> it, i like that uh, that's good it fulfills it self-fulfills the, the authoritative force of problems and and that's kind of where I think things are lacking. I mean, let's look at Denver. Everybody and their brother has come here with a new glass pipe or a new bong, a new vape pen, a new edible. And 
a lot of these shop owners, well, they're inundated. They have been hit by a thousand different people that say, buy mine, it's the greatest in the world, you'll love it. And they've been burned 90 times out of 100. That's the problem. As I've talked about before, it's the infrastructure, right? Mm -hmm. Is that when you're dealing with a big corporation, surprisingly, there's an easy way to do sales because they have people who are dedicated as buyers and people who are dedicated in certain positions to receive that channel of people soliciting and doing stuff. In a small business, typically with the multiple hats everybody's wearing, nobody's really dedicated as who handles the solicitors, right? Who handles the marketers? Who handles the salespeople? Well, I guess just keep pointing him to that guy. I guess he's Mm -hmm. the owner, right? And then the owner gets overwhelmed and burned out and then shuts them completely off. And now you've just shut off the source of people who bring you the new product to the market, the people who are showing you what other people are seeing, the people who potentially might actually have a product that you want to carry. So now you're just creating barriers and and then it it starts to work against itself. Do you deal with that? Well, that's actually our biggest challenge. Yeah. At times we'll go go into (laughs) dispensaries and we will hand out samples, which they will love, but they have no channels even to their boss to where they can say, hey, I love this. You should put it on your shelf. So it's, it's a little frustrating. So the other channels in a bigger bigger sales uh, realm are things like conventions and networking meetings and stuff that, you know, people that work in corporations, they go to the, the yearly conventions and they go to the weekly, you know, meetings and they go out and they represent. Uh, because, again, there's people who are dedicated that that's their job. You know, that's the specific hat they wear. How do you balance the sales and the marketing as well as just maintaining the internal infrastructure of the company? It's a very fine line because you've got to invest a lot into the marketing, but a lot of the the avenues that are out there don't really do what we need them to do. Print ads, well, they're less and less. Let's face it, uh, there's only one or two magazines that are really worth anything nowadays, but more popping up every day, clamoring for your dollar. And that's one way to get to people, but if there's a hundred new magazines in a two-year period, what good is that? Somebody like you that might be able to do a quicker response and a broadcast that would let people know, hey, these are the things that passed certain levels with you. You find them good. They're worthwhile. Let's see what we can do to get them out there. Well, I've always found myself to be a somewhat honest critiquer. I mean, when people ask me to critique their products or anything else, whether it's somebody who wants to sponsor or anything else, I just naturally look kind of like what you do. You kind of look at a product and you're like, oh, you know, how could this be? How could this be better? Well, with that same ability to see how it could be better, you can probably easily spot the faults and the flaws in in existing things. And sometimes that's just kind of in your DNA of who you are. If somebody puts a product in front of you, you're going to naturally, you know, this, this is how I would do it differently. Sometimes it sits well, sometimes it doesn't. But as a company, you can't run yourself into the ground redesigning your product every week because somebody criticizes it. But you have to maintain a consistent standard of quality. How do you manage the actual day-to-day operations of buying products, manufacturing product and then getting that out the door to your sales and retail people? Well, it's the team that makes the difference. I have a couple of really good guys. Ron, my chief of operations, used to own his own soap business, which is not too different than the cleaner that we have with weed wipes. So I he's used to been... sell vacuum cleaners. Maybe we have uh, an ability. <laughs> that sounds like that sucks. I'm sorry, buddy. <laughs> hey, I was young. And... You know, no, it yeah. sucks. <laughs> I need the money. It was once when I was in college. I mean, come on. I'd sell my sperm if I had to. There was so much money involved. And if they bought the air filter machine, there was an extra bonus. <laughs> Which one was it? Because I got... Uh, the Filter Queen. Oh, okay. I got a TriStar that's still working. Yeah. yeah. The Filter Queen sold for $2,750. But if <gasps> you bought the air filter, it was $3,150. And uh, you could do easy $100 payments for 30 36 months. Holy shit. But it would last you for the next 30 plus years because it was a filter queen, a majestic filter queen that used the uh, centrifugal force, if I said that word right, of cleaning that when the dirt came in, it would hit a 
wall that would force it to the right and begin to spin in a circle, creating a suction of the dirt being held to the outside wall as it spun. So the filter was a cone-faced filter that went in the middle, so only the air would go through the filter, and the filter would never clog, which is ultimately the demise of a Any machine you put air into it. Because the, the problem is that if you have a bag and you put air into it, and the bag doesn't explode, it means there's holes in the bag. So when you're vacuuming with a bag-type system, you're essentially just blowing out fine dust all over the room, which is why they tell old people not to vacuum, right? Because you'll have a heart attack. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the filter queen basically prevents clogging. And if you never have dirt going through a filter, that means you never have dirt going through an engine. And the engine never creates the friction of the grind and the burn. Right. So... Why I really came here today is to ask you, are you ready <laughs> for are you three sure you 36 are? payments of just $100? You, too, can be the fine owner of a Phil <laughs> Queen Majestic you home cleaning you machine. You used to do this for money, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's how ingrained things get into you, right? When you do oh, these, yeah. like, door-to-door type sale type things, it just becomes so repetitious. And, you know, I'm sure you do trade shows and everything else, and you have Indeed. a pitch, and it, you know, it becomes, it becomes, yeah, it's, it's just ingrained so into the head because it's burned, mm-hmm. burned in there. Yeah, unfortunately, but, uh, I'm, I've got a terrible brain. I, I was involved in this accident in uh-oh. 96 where a lady broadsided me with this uh, uh, LTD. It was right at, at Sheridan and uh, 6th Avenue, getting off on westbound 6th Avenue. Oh, Go geez. down the hill, and there's that light. And this hey, lady up. hits me right on the side, and my head actually left a dent in the door frame of the Dodge Caravan, oh, the metal yeah. door frame. Yeah, it was about a, a five-inch long dent that was about half-inch deep. So I had this closed brain trauma that... I lost about 85% of my visual and verbal memory. Really? Oh, yeah. So you don't remember, like, what, your past? Well, I it's the short-term stuff. So all the long-term ingrained, like what you're talking about, yeah, all still right there. Yeah. But it might take three times of meeting somebody before I'll even admit that I've ever met them. Wow. Yeah, because that can happen. How, how do you how do you mitigate that? Like, do you have sticky notes or like, like yes. uh, tattoos and you put on your arm like the dude from Memento? And- well, actually, if you start relying on that stuff, it's a technique, but it's also a down-the-hill kind of thing. You know. Well, I, I met you for the slope. first time Monday. Uh-huh. Then I came to We Do I Wednesday. Uh-huh. Today's Saturday, so today is the third <laughs> time I've met you. Within a week. <laughs> um, so am I in now? Am oh, I yeah, in the yeah, vault? Yeah, am, yeah. I, am I in the Well, you, you see, and, and that's the big thing. I mean, <laughs> with a name like I mean, how can you not remember that one? Right. So what, what is the entomology of your name? I'm, I'm uh, Well, would be like an Arabic-based name. But I myself was born in Madison, Wisconsin to a, a first generation from Nicaragua and a mother from a Dutch-German type back. Wow. So I'm, a, I'm a mixture of, uh, I guess, a, a, a German-Spanish... Central American Spanish kind of uh, German mix from Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> that covers the entire planet. I'm <laughs> you just well, everywhere. at least this uh, hemisphere, this side. Right? Uh. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. I mean, the the name itself was uh, because my father once originally named me Julio, right? Mm. Obviously, coming from Nicaragua, and my mom was like, uh, "I don't, I don't know." I mean, she's from Wisconsin, and you know, her dad went to the Eagles Club, <laughs> no, played. Yeah. Racquetball, you yeah, know, like, oh, smokes cigars go indoors, <laughs> smokes pipes and cigars indoors with the kids at home. You know, he's that yeah. kind of guy. Eats ice cream in, in the morning with his eggs. Oh, my um, God. <laughs> But she was like, I, I don't know, I'm not down with Julio. So they looked through a bunch of books, and long story short, uh, they found yeah, uh, which is like a, a Moorish type name, you mm. know. For, it was a general who invaded southern Spain, a Moor that dominated Spain for you know hundreds of years, centuries and centuries. Interesting. Which is why in southern Spain there are darker complexion, darker eyes, darker uh, hair, because the mixture of hundreds of years of being invaded by the Moors from northern Africa. Wow. And then of course uh, the Spaniards then invading all of South and Central America. My father and his family are first generation here uh, to the U.S. So I guess that makes me second generation yeah that, that that's my background well wow, it's really interesting different kind of combination you know choose a name that has uh, it's not common to either one right but is, is you know famous on its own level All right what, what what about you oh i'm uh german with a smattering of just about anything else you can throw in there my uh father's mother's maiden name was stutzi Oh, so yeah. that was, you know, that was, she was the old country one. Sounds very German. Stutzi. Yeah. Stutzi. 
Good so, chair. Yeah. So uh, we, I, I was raised originally in Arnold, Missouri, which is about 20 miles outside of St. Louis. Really? So you're you're like a Southern boy. Mm, somewhat, yeah. yeah. Kind of mid-state there. And uh, I actually grew up about uh, about five blocks from where they raised the Clydesdales. Wow. My brother had his foot stepped on by one of them. Wow. But they are the Clydesdales for Budweiser that so you, draw the and Budweiser And you drink wagon. Budweiser to this day. See how the advertising works? How that oh long-term life advertising, as they call it? It's getting <laughs> yeah. people hooked from, uh, from birth? Yeah. Uh, no, no more. Not right now. I'm confused. So how do you enough. get from Missouri to Colorado. Well, my my father and his brother, my uncle Bob, used to work together, had a falling out. We moved from St. Louis out to Colorado for dad to strike out on his own at 45 years old. Yeah. So uh, it was kind of an unusual thing, but he took the whole family of six kids and started a new life out in Colorado. He, at that point, uh, not really having a major midlife crisis in the fact that he wanted to be a ski patrolman. <laughs> that Which, was his life dream. Well, to that's ski what in the he wanted to be. He actually was a ski patrolman at that's Pierre like Marquette in Saying Illinois. you want to be a surfer, though, right? That Pretty just close. means you're a stoner, and yeah, right. Fortunately for us, Dad chose the better <laughs> path, and we actually made enough money to survive. <laughs> As being a ski patrol, no, no, no. He just that did that for fun. That was the side. dream. Yeah, yeah. So what? What was your dream? Was it? Cleaning, cleaning products? Oh, no. I was uh, too blind to become the pilot that I wanted to be. I had, I had actually learned the entire private pilot's handbook by the time I was 16. Wow. At the exact same year, they said, 16-year-olds can't be. You have to be 18. Oh. Yeah, which sucked ass. When did the vision go? Actually, in the last, uh, about, about 15 years ago. Oh. But was it was it during that time of being 16 to 18 when you were waiting to be a pilot? No, it was, hey, between the time 16 to 18, I discovered women. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't care about flying. No, no, that's not it. I just, I just. Where did you go? I mean, you, you stated that you were dropped out of ninth grade. Right. Well, I did try and go to Job Corps voluntarily. That's oh, usually yeah. a place that is uh, reserved for... Oh, yeah. uh, I had many of friends who did the Job Corps mm-hmm. route. What a fun thing to do. <laughs> uh, ended up about... I couldn't stand that. About when I, when I turned 19, I started my own business uh, doing furniture installation and moving, which is something yeah. I had learned my whole life because my father and uncle owned Berry Business Interiors in St. Louis. So you and that a, was a furniture installation and uh, office furniture place. You have a, a knack of entrepreneurship kind of in your blood. A little bit. That yeah. allowed you to just immediately seek that self-sustained route to get out there and start doing something. Very much so. I just didn't realize how tough it was. Within the first year, I developed an ulcer and hey. TMJ. Uh, hey. Couldn't move my jaw because it was so locked up from tension. I uh, got rid of the business and started working at government contract sales as their installer and worked all the way up. So wow. got to be the vice president. So selling furniture is that stressful, that intense? Well, no, it was the install. Uh, JB Movers was actually an install company. And, and at 19 years old, I had a crew of 15 guys that I was making, well, I was making 10 bucks an hour on them. And yeah. at, my, at that time, that was pretty good cash. Yeah. But to keep those many people juggling is really tough. Yeah, yeah, a lot to learn. Yes, and, and I was way un, unprepared well, for that. Well, you know, I've, I've thought about this because as I get older, about when I was really young, about the jobs I used to have, and then the long periods of non, just meaningless type jobs. So you've had jobs that were important and, and felt something, and then you had a fluff in, in between, yeah. you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Menial, minimum wage, just working just to pay pay bills type stuff. And then, you know, as you get older, you kind of look back and see the roller coaster of going through these different types of jobs and careers. Mm-hmm. And you go, oh, geez, you know, if only I would have had this one when I was older, mm. then I would have understood how to how to use it and profit off of it. But because for some stupid reason, you, you get these type of jobs passed to you when you're young and then you fail out of them, you know, and then you go through the whole life doesn't make sense. You cry a little bit. You drop to your knees. You, <laughs> you know, damn God. And then you get back up and you, you I guess you, you keep moving forward. Well, that's exactly <laughs> it, I think. I mean, I, I've had some odd stuff handed to me on many occasions, uh, like the 15 broken bones and 
and aye. all that kind aye, of aye, stuff. Aye. What, oh. what was that? Your motorcycle accident? Or? No, no. Actually, I've, I've totaled two motorcycles into deer, and I've never put a motorcycle down. And I've even had a rear tire blowout on I-70. My first one, uh, six years old, dad ran over me with the car. You, what? You know. <laughs> Uh, I'm the reason why they don't allow you to lay in front of cars at drive-in theater. Dad uh, missed one of the six, is all I can say. I actually just found out recently. I mean, I'm that, that was when I was, like I say, six years old. You don't I'm, remember. You suppressed uh, the trauma so much. I did, much actually, that... for many years. Wow. Oh, you yeah. Run I, over. Uh, well, and I, I found out recently that not only did he run me over, but he didn't know what that thing was he drove over, so he backed up. Oh. So that was the first of, you know, the concussion, broken leg, that kind of stuff. And, wow. And, and the worst one, I've, I, I think, is the doing the Charlie Chaplin in the bathtub and landing with the middle of my back on the rim. Ah. Uh, and that still brings tears uh, to the eyes. It reminds me of that movie Blood In, Blood Out. Uh, they drop him on the fire hydrant. Uh, oh. Uh, ow. <laughs> oh. Uh, so the worst you one started ever. life with lots of physical pain. Oh, yeah. Not just now me doing it, but Dad pain. helped. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, I had a, uh, I had a, 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 a tough childhood. I'll just say that. Man. <laughs> Number so five of six is that, not a good That one. puts a little fire in your belly, yeah? It makes you keep moving forward. It gives you that, that kind of... Uh, Drive to succeed? Uh, yeah? You know, I, I think so. I mean, most of my family are, are very intelligent people and things right. like that. They're, they may not be, you know, the heads of state or anything like that, but my sister Sue is one of the best wood refinishers in the St. Louis area. Really? Yeah, she left to stay back there and she does the like somebody finishing. scrapes the furniture and you come yeah, or and even it. the interior of these old magnificent mansions i mean she lives in this 30 room mansion that is spiraling staircases built in the 06 area or something like oh, that wow. it was transferred it transformed several times at one point it was an apartment complex of 10 different rooms sounds well, like you the yeah. design your father the design your sister you know well yeah and they, i mean dad did uh he bought a piece of property up in dillon that nobody wanted for a song he did the demolition and over the next 10 years built a three level five you know five level home with a detached garage hand rubbed aspen wood ceilings and these really cool fireplaces that have weird stuff right wedged into them it could have a bicycle kickstand or an arrow or compressor head or something like that and it's just weird shit. <laughs> that, that, that is also a similar uh, dream and desire I would like to have is a, a good chunk of land somewhere with a good place, you know, a, get a, a getaway place and mm-hmm. have it self-sustained and, and next to free, paid for type thing and just have it be your place, you know, yeah. you know, whatever, for better or for worse, apocalypse comes or that's you just need a weekend going. getaway. <laughs> either or. <laughs> you know, that's two ends of the spectrum there, yeah. man. But either ah, or, right? it's good for the weekend, but the apocalypse. Well, I mean, it, it reminds me of being a kid. When I was a kid, we had a plot of land outside of Durango, and we'd go there on weekends and spend the weekend in the cabin, and you know, and just sit around the campfire and got to roam around the land and have that freedom and that openness to just go out and, and be in the the nature. And stuff. Exactly. Enjoy what life oh, has yeah. for you. And that's what the whole big thing is. I mean, think about all the little toxins you have every day that are being created and killing nature yeah. all the time. Yeah. It just, it, it bothers me. When you when you registered your business, uh, when did you register your business? Uh, January 1st of this year, basically. All right. Yeah. So when you did that, you did it with a state that gave you a business license, right? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. How, how are you structured? Basically, we have the management staff, which is myself and Ron, they're, we're the only two that are paid. Everyone beneath us that uh, is out there, they are literally just salespeople and they're commissioned salesperson. You know, we give them a 1099, they do their own taxes. It's like you were saying, it's being at the very beginning of, yeah. say, Apple. So they've all joined a a board basically almost as interns and at this point they are not making all that much money but every employee down from me isn't getting paid unless we get paid what i suggested what chris does since he's going to take some classes at red rocks is to go with the department of uh, try to get credits for internship working because i'm also a uh, registered llc if he's working he might as well try to get some type of credit out of it so yeah that makes sense see, uh, have all your people take a single class at red rocks community college or <laughs> 
<laughs> you can get a credit. I mean, it's a lot of responsibility, right? Because when you're not paying somebody, it's like, well, I wish I'd rather just pay him because at least then I would have some control over the situation, right? Exactly. There's there's uh, no admonishing like, you anybody. You be here at this time. You're going to do this many hours a week. This is what you're going to do. You know, you're a paid position and you have a job description and it's outlined. You know, it's a it's a job. When, when somebody's unpaid, it's always a little loosey-goosey, if I can use that term. Yeah, that's a no, term I, that's I usable. may show up. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, everything's a voluntary mm-hmm. uh, basis. I will do this for the time being. I choose to do this, you know. Right, right. And that, you know, that's always a struggle. But at this point, do you have outside investors who are willing to inject money and grow the business where you can start to fund salaries in ventures? Actually, we do. There is an individual who heard of us and actually approached us. We came to some very good terms. So we've got an injection of cash, okay. uh, which allows us to buy more of the product uh, uh, pre-sampled into the bo- bottles that it needs to be. Yeah, yeah, it's actually taking off fast because of this guy. And he, he gets uh, a very small percentage out of it, which is a great thing for us. Can I give my, my segment that I do? It's called Unsolicited Recommendations. Sure. <laughs> Can I give you my unsolicited recommendations? I, I welcome information uh, on any <laughs> level. I would recommend a little bit of focus and money directed towards dispensing type applications to use your product in a more user-friendly, applicable way to make the actual process of cleaning be what becomes more attached and proprietary to what you're doing because the product itself may clean, but if it's difficult to use, it may not get used. I've used it a number of times, even with the liquid, it was way easier than the paste, Mm -hmm. but I was still lacking the overall utensils or dispensing device. I was actually thinking, you know, it would be perfect. Have you ever seen those uh, teeth cleaning picks that shoot out water those right that would be perfect to get up in there and just knock some things away but the overall product of weed wipes producing more more things than just those little brushes you got because those those don't do the job 100 percent to be to be honest so to put a little bit more focus into not just growing the product of the actual product but also how do i apply and dispense this product to make it easier for me to use because then i can really consume the product itself indeed well actually there's several things on the horizon one of which is by use of interior cleaning portion the, the quick and easy way to take care of getting to those hard to reach spots yeah because let's face it if you're talking about a bong once you clean it you'll never have to clean it again anything that's water-based you just put a few drops in one drop per inch of bong and uh at that point you can rinse it clean the next day because the resin will prefer to attach to the weed wipes right but when you're talking about getting a bong clean the first time heat is your friend Mm -hmm. so you rinse it in hot water but if you've got hard to reach spots you can do as my competitors do with your own salt Just add a little to some warmed up weed wipes and put some salt down there. The warm weed wipe, shake it around as my competitors do, and it'll come out just as well. When you say competitors, what are we talking about? A handful, uh, a magazine full? Uh, What's the market size? Actually, there's approximately 60 different manufacturers of of some variation of cleaning products. You just jumped into the lion's den. Yeah, it's terrible. (laughs) But there's one thing that separates all of them. When you go to every single one of my competitors, they have one thing in common that is different from me. They have Poison Control Center's number on their label. I don't even have a warning label. Mine is natural plant-based oils. Your shtick is to uh, take a shot of it, right? Sure. I, yeah. I've, dr- I've probably guzzled about a gallon of it over the yeah. last six months. Well, it's a powerful effect. I mean, go- going back just a, a quick to what I was saying about selling the vacuum cleaners, part of that demonstration was to put a piece of white bread between the filter and the motor, clean a bunch of it, show people all the, the, the dirt you picked up, and then open the motor and show the bread was clean and then eat the bread, right? Oh so when God. you do a demonstration, you have to have, just like the guy Sal- selling the, the salsa making machine, making the salsa, you got to have something that just reaches out and grabs somebody and usually self-inducing uh, yourself uh, <laughs> to, to the product is a good way of doing it, right? Exactly. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's funny. But have is there a way to turn 
the the patent chemical of what you have into other states like hardened states and soft gel states and liquid states and paste states i mean obviously you have the paste and you have the liquid can you keep going and make it a hard form not really because the the uses for that uh, typically would be something like the what some of my competitors have as a scissors cleaner uh-huh. where you just press the scissors into it but i have actually a better system than that it's an ultrasonic cleaning system that you can do up to 20 pairs of scissors in three minutes. Right. You run it through three minute ultrasonic with heat, let them hang for a minute, and then do a final wipe down, and I, they're ready to use. And they will last about 20% longer than what isopropyl alcohol would if you were to just wipe it with iso. I was actually thinking a slightly different use of being able to make it harder is that you create a dip, right? So you take your pipe and you dip it into the liquid form so it coats it entirely, and then you bring it out and it hard and then you have a thin layer on your device of the the weed wipe so the product just doesn't even stick. It just slides continuously off the the, the pipe itself. It creates a force field, if you will. And and I could see that, (laughs) but also I could see being at a party, taking about, I don't know, 10 bowls and smoking them heavy and putting that in my pocket, walking home and watching the oil drip into my pants pocket. Well, obviously I would have the best scientist in the world uh, (laughs) design it and create it and work on it. So it works. Perfectly. I mean, uh, that's a given. But we can only do it if we use a little bit of isotope 328, (laughs) and that's very toxic. It would be like the vapor riser. They poo right. <laughs> <laughs> Smokes that shit right in the right in your pipe. <laughs> well, well, what about that? What about? I mean, what are the other applications that we can do with this? Is it just contact and wipe away type thing? Is that? Well, when you think about it, the level that we're talking about is kind of cool because not only does it do the resin, but it will also work on dabs and concentrates. Mm-hmm. It will also work on the extractor parts for the high pressure extraction units and it will work on the not only the scissors but say the interior of the dispensary have those jars where they display the bud yeah that gets cloudy and they're using iso to clean those it kind of fits in in a lot of different places as a matter of fact um i think you had your your tray here that i cleaned a few little trichomes off of it was a little sticky and i got that cleaned off and it works you know it could be a degooer degooer i like would it work for gum and other types of uh, sticky type product? Actually, it works on things like labels that you're trying to get the adhesive off of. So if I put a sticker on a wall and pull the sticker off and it leaves behind that gooey white backside of the sticker, that could be applied and wiped off. Indeed. Well, there's a secondary use. There's a infomercial right there. (laughs) Billy Mays could sell the shit out of that. Well, I will say (laughs) that you know how you usually get organic products that are natural that work like crap? Yeah. In comparison to Goof Off as a label adhesive remover, right. mine will work like crap because uh, it's all natural. I so mean, Goof uh, Off works really well for that shit. Yeah, I mean, I nat- might want to you know tweak that yeah. just a little. But I mean, I get I get where you're going with it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I see where this can go, and I see the potential. And you're only a few months in now. Have you been self funding all the way up to this point? Very much so, and that's kind of one of the things that I'm fairly proud of is with just a modicum of money, whatever I garnered from being in government contract sales, I managed to turn this company in six months to being valued at a million dollars. Right. So value, however, is not cash in right. flux. <laughs> right. But it helps leverage certain things. You yes, know, indeed. Helps, and um, when you especially have attract people... attention to have more people join your team. You know, mm-hmm. people want to join growing and winning products and companies. Exactly. You know. Have you thought about doing any type of crowdfunding uh, based on this? You know, I am not familiar enough with crowdfunding to say one way or the other. Who's your main marketing guy that's working for you? Well, that's kind of the the tough thing. Uh, Right now, it is uh, Greg Stodgill out in in Grand Junction. Uh, He originally joined on as he is also an intern. Uh, He has been in the marketing business for years. His wife is actually still working in marketing and is six-figure income, powerful woman. What they do is off-site, and I hate that. And I'm a uh, face-to-face guy. I like that. I mean, I would say if he's your marketing guy, tell him. You know, do a crowdfunding campaign on like Indiegogo because it's basically putting together just a profile online 
online and putting together a story of why you're seeking money and investment for what your product is, creating some basic media, like a little three minute video of what your pitch is, creating some uh, text, like a couple paragraphs of what your story is, Mm -hmm. creating some incentives of what people are going to get. You already have incentives of what you can give people who donate money. Mm -hmm. And then it's taking that campaign and just promoting it. So just tell your marketing guy who I would say should know what a crowdfunding campaign is. And it's just a matter of him using the information that should be on a file in the computer somewhere of things like profile and descriptions and all that, you know, images, pictures. Maybe the only new expense would be doing a video, a little three minute pitch video that you put up there. And then you put it up online and you publish it to the world and the world can see why you're seeking money and how much money you're seeking. Basically, the website just charges you 4% if you meet your goal or uh, 10% if you don't meet your goal. So let's say you your goal is to raise $10,000 and you only raise 5000 The website charges you uh, 500 10, bucks. 10, 10%. Yeah. yeah I'm five. not a math major, but uh, okay. I believe you if that's what you say. <laughs> uh, I'm a communications type. <laughs> well, and that's it, a very good deal, actually, and I should very, uh, I will look into it that. It gives you the possibility of raising some money that's not necessarily out of pocket because, you know, not that you have to be a believer in OPP or wait, was it OPM? <laughs> Other people's money? Yeah. Right? Uh, uh, yeah, I think OPP is a. Uh other people's by, problems, uh, isn't it? <laughs> a song. Uh, uh, um, anyway, you know, as as I always uh, used to hear people say when I worked in the financial industry is never use your own money, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> never use your own that's, money. That's the best right? idea. So, but always I've, use somebody I've, else's money because uh, there's risk involved. And if it goes south, I guess an apology is far better than jumping out of a building because you lost your entire savings. But I think crowdfunding now is allowing people like you to bring your story personally to the public. So you can go directly to people out there and say, hey, I'm the owner and founder. This is my product. This is my company. This is why I'm raising money. This is what I'm going to use the money for. We're trying to get so much inventory. We're trying to do this. Donate $10, $20, $40, $50, and then throw in like a $10,000 and have (laughs) little incentives along the way that are very comparable to the amount they're donating. And then uh, go out there and promote that campaign. So when you're out there at your event, you're promoting our crowdfunding campaign. Get people, see if they'll support you, donate money. Money. What they're really doing is just buying the incentive, right? But they're buying the incentive based on the idea of helping you grow your money. So they're giving you a donation, but if there are no incentive, it would be unlikely they would give you a donation. But you already have that because you already have developed products. Exactly. So you can easily stack together packages that meet a very comparable 10, 20, 40, 50, 80, and $10,000. You always want to throw, you always throw in the likes. whale. Always throw in the big kahuna. That makes um, sense. And, and have it be like somebody can own 0.025% of the company or something, you know, you t- something like that. And, and then have your interview along the way. And then uh, go out there and promote that campaign for, you know, 45 days or whatever. And then, wow. That, that could be a great way to get some money and uh, not really have uh, a lot of risk at all. Right. But it also gives a good center focal points of campaigning activities, of marketing activities. Mm-hmm. Now you have a centered focal point of what you're doing over the next 45 days is you're focusing on this campaign. So all the branding and activities are geared towards support the crowdfunding, you know. And then after that's over, then... I guess you go back to whatever your standard procedures and protocol were. But let's oh, get that. Sounds interesting. Track. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can lose direction real quick, especially with as many bong hits as we have. Oh, speaking of, should we take a bong hit? I think so. <laughs> We're all over Facebook with Weed Wipes, and we're on WeedWipes.com. Excellent. Well, I appreciate your time on this uh, lovely Saturday afternoon out here at your home office, corporate office, heart and soul of Weed Wipes. Thanks for inviting us out. Thanks for coming. This has been wonderful. Thanks for listening to this week's show. Make sure to come back next week. We're going to have more guests lined up speaking with dispensary owners, growers, business owners. Make sure to follow us on all of the social media, Facebook, Google+. You can listen to our shows live from the website or your preferred listening platform. Find us on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spreaker, even YouTube, all under the same name, CannabisCommunityProject.com. We'll see you next week. Come on!